I'm Dr. Kerry McInerney. Dr. Eleanor Drage and I are the hosts of the Good Robot podcast. Join us as we ask the experts, what is good technology? Is it even possible? And how can feminism help us work towards it? If you want to learn more about today's topic, head over to our website, www.thegoodrobot.co.uk, where we've got a full transcript of the episode and a specially curated reading list by every guest. We love hearing from listeners, so feel free to tweet or email us, and we'd also so appreciate you leaving us a review on the podcast app. But until then, sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. This week, we're talking to Melissa Hekula, a senior tech reporter at MIT Tech Review, about image generation, porn, chat GPT, and the stories that we tell about AI. We hope you enjoy the show. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. So just to kick us off, could you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and what's brought you to journalism and writing about good or ethical technology? My name is Melissa Heikela. I'm a senior reporter at MIT Technology Review, where I write about AI and, and how AI affects us individuals and, and our societies. And uh, I think I've been one of those freaks who's always known that they want to be a journalist. Ever since I knew what a journalist was, I wanted to be one. And I think for the first part of my career, I was desperately trying to find a beat, trying to find a focus. And then I sort of accidentally stumbled into tech. I've always been really interested about tech, and I think one of my first big professional stories was about an Instagram influencer back in 2013 when this was like a new thing, but only really got into the tech beat around 2016, I guess, or 17, and have been writing about it ever since. Before joining Tech Review, I was at, at The Economist, where I wrote some tech stories, and at Politico in Brussels, where I covered tech policy. It was a time when the EU in particular was really starting to like roll out the world's first tech regulations and and the AI Act was still very much like a new thing then. So I really got to see how a piece of regulation gets started, you know, from the intense lobbying, the speculation to the first draft and then and then negotiations. So so yeah, (laughs) that's how I got into tech reporting. And, and then covering feminism, gender and technology, I mean, it's something that's always been super close to me. And I grew up in Finland, but I'm half Chinese. So growing up in a country which is extremely homogenous and being always kind of othered and, you know, the only non-white person in newsroom and basically every newsroom until fairly recently, I think they're just topics I have lots of personal experience about and I guess know a lot about and and really feel like I can bring value and and give a a voice and experience to people who don't necessarily have that in mainstream media because of my personal experience. And I think AI is like a great lens into that as well. I feel like it's because everything is AI and you can talk about super nerdy technical things or you can talk about how it affects humans and people and how bias creeps into these systems. And how amazing that you can stumble into something and then be one of the best in the field. I mean, that's extraordinary. (laughs) So with your overview of tech from a journalist's perspective, then I'm really interested in your take on our our big three good robot questions. So what is good technology? Is it even possible? And how can feminism help us work towards it? What would you say to that as a journalist? Yeah, well, looking at the past year in tech or in AI, we've really seen the explosion of you know, chat GPT and, and this kind of language technology that millions of people have tried, been able to try for the first time themselves. And, you know, we've been thinking a lot about how is this technology going to change our lives or societies or blah, blah, blah. But I actually think the more I think about it, the more I think that this technology, like good technology, is something that assists us in our day to day lives, that like supports us in our decision making and our creativity, helps us be more productive. I don't know if we should we can be more productive than we already are but you know like really augments us instead of replaces us and and i think about good technology that i use you know like transcribing software or online translators we kind of forget that that's ai but it is like 10 years ago though that technology was completely impossible or like well or like a long way away and now we just use it every day and we forget it's ai technology so i'm hoping we'll land somewhere like that with this new technology, that'll be just something that supports our decision making 
instead of, you know, AI language models <laughs> becoming extremely powerful tools for disinformation or other terrible uses. So I'm, I'm optimistic that AI will become very boring. And I think feminism is super, super important in that development. Like if we can especially take into account, you know, intersectional feminism and taking into account people like genders and races and classes and how this technology affects them and, you know, how do we reduce harms in these groups and, you know, be, be very inclusive in technology from the very beginning. I think we have a chance of this technology becoming a really powerful, helpful tool instead of a shit show. I feel like what we all aspire to, please, <laughs> please let this become a boring and a mundane thing <laughs> rather than this sort of massively overhyped set of tools and technologies. <laughs> absolute disaster you know and I think that's one of the most challenging things I think about I see for you anyway as a journalist and then for us as researchers but people who are trying to shape the stories and the narratives that we tell about AI is how do we walk the line between really being adequate in our coverage of the dangers of these technologies while also not just trying to you know freaking people out to the point where they feel really disempowered and unable to engage with these concepts anymore and that's partly why we started this podcast is we wanted to walk a line between kind of the silicon valley techno optimism this drive towards relentless productivity which as Eleanor has kind of rightly pointed out to me numerous times, like, why is the base assumption that productivity is always the best thing versus, yeah, this extreme techno pessimism that makes you think, well, I might as well accept every cookie that exists because <laughs> there's no getting out of the arena of big tech. Um, so how do you find this? What's your life like as a tech journalist? Are there particular angles or stories that you feel like you're often being pushed to explore or, you know, what kinds of stories and angles are you trying to platform or take? Yeah. I'm not going to lie, this past year has been mad. Even a year ago, AI was this super niche, nerdy topic. You know, people would kind of raise an eyebrow like, oh, okay, whatever. And now everyone wants to talk about AI and chat GPT. Like I'm in a cafe or a ski lift and someone's talking about how they use chat GPT to write copy for their business. It, you know, it's it's kind of overwhelming and I'm <laughs> kind of fed up with AI. But it's also been quite challenging because now everyone wants to talk and write about it. And and you're like, OK, well, how do I add some value in the noise? And, you know, how do I tell stories that haven't been told before and and, you know, tell smart stories as well that aren't just corporate hype in a way? So it is it is a real challenge constantly. But what I really appreciate about MIT Tech Review is that we aren't, you know, we aren't told do this like they really trust our expertise and give us lots of freedom to pursue the kinds of stories I want so even though now for the past six months everyone's been talking about generative AI I'm kind of done with that and trying to find ways beyond that like looking at there, there's so much AI that's applied in our lives every day you know I want to think about how Surveillance technology, like what's happening there, computer vision, that's still a massive problem, but everyone seems to have forgotten about that, you know, what's happening there or or how the public sector uses AI. I think that's something I would love to pursue in the future, but also looking at, you know, how now that we have generative AI and companies are rolling it out into products, like what kind of effects that's having on people. So looking at yeah the consequences of this. Yeah, I mean, there's just a lot to cover. Yeah, I, I agree. The second order effects are more interesting than just the first order stuff. And we get asked a lot of questions about ChatGPT and generative AI that we're often not well equipped to respond to. And it's a question mm -hmm. of, you know, if people don't really know what questions to ask, how do you give them a good response or give them information that's interesting and actually tells them something about the situation and what's going on in the world? Hmm. And I think a lot of like uh, our job is is also to sort of be an educator, like, you know, MIT Technology Review, it has this sort of credibility. And I feel like we, you know, we, we want to be the place where you can find a, a trustworthy, reliable answer to a tricky technical question, you know, and, and that's why it's so important always, always, always to say, OK, this is a good thing, but, you know, we know it has these flaws. Or, or even just highlighting these technical flaws that these language models have that people don't seem to be really talking about. Like, I wrote a story a couple of weeks ago about security vulnerabilities in language models. Turns out it's super, super easy to hack it, for, hack into them for outsiders to take control of your language model. And then if you're using that in a browser, you know, from through Bing or, or whatever, 
they can become extremely powerful scamming and hacking and phishing tools, which is quite a scary thought, considering that now millions of people are using them and we don't have any sort of tools to prevent these kind of risks. Absolutely. And yeah, on the one hand, you know, it feels like these kind of ethical issues have been massively brought into the spotlight. And certainly I think Eleanor and I can completely resonate with, you know, just being almost very tired about talking about chat GPT or having this like very, what felt like a very niche AI ethics issue around large language models suddenly become, you know, a kind of dinner table talking point. Although your story about the ski lift did make me giggle a little bit because it's like, you're like the living version of that Gwyneth Paltrow meme from her trial, which is <laughs> half a day of skiing. Like what's the big, the third one effect of chat GPT? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, something I though love about what you say about the MIT Tech Review is like, I think you're not only educating kind of the general reader, but also I think showing journalists maybe what kinds of responsible stories we can be telling about these technologies. And so what do you advise other journalists who are maybe starting to report on AI for the first time? A lot of journalists I know are in this position because of chat GPT. Like what kinds of practices do you think are really important? Or are there any things you think that journalists should avoid when they're talking about AI and related data-driven technologies? Yeah, I think it's great that so many newsrooms are picking this up and, and paying attention to this technology because that's like one of the most powerful tools we have to hold these tech companies to account because we just don't have regulation right now. But it does frustrate me a lot when a lot of people, you know, haven't maybe had the opportunity or don't even have the time to think about these things, you know, in depth. And so stories often get rushed and, you know, narrative, you know, it's quite easy to get the ready-made narrative from a tech company. But one of the things, and, and like buy into the hype that these technologies can actually do more than they can. Like they're actually quite, you know, simple, stupid systems, even though they look very fancy and have all like, bells and all these bells and whistles but one thing that drives me absolutely mad is when people anthropomorphize ai systems say you know this technology can see or say or like you know tell me to leave my wife (laughs) that drives me mad because you know that's basically giving these tech companies free pr you're like oh this ai is so smart that it can tell me to do things about my love life and you know and then not go into Okay, how does this language model actually work? Like, why is it do? Why is it behaving this way? Why is it doing that? And you know, it can't actually tell you to do any of those things. It's just generating text. So, so using precise language, I think, is super, super important, and not overhyping technologies and their capabilities. One super annoying thing that you often see is like, oh, this AI can predict criminality or something. Like, here's where crime hap- is going to happen. You know, and that. It just can't do that. You can't, we, we haven't developed technology that can predict the future. <laughs> so that frustrates me. We found the same thing when we had reporting on our paper about how hiring technologies can't remove bias. And a mm. lot of the reporting actually was really good, but then we had one newspaper say, woke technology doesn't work. And we're like, oh God, you know. <laughs> But, you know, we, ap- we appreciate any headline at all. So <laughs> um, beggars can't be Jesus. What, we, in your view, you know, the biggest tech stories of, of last year and what did you want readers to understand about those stories? I mean, the rise of ChatGPT has been a huge story and everyone has tried it at this point. And I hope people have read at least one story that kind of goes into how these language models work, what they actually can and cannot do. So people have a realistic understanding of what they're getting themselves into when they interact with these models, especially now that we're starting to see some data protection regulators investigating privacy problems. You know, you probably shouldn't be telling these computer programs your deepest, darkest secrets and your you know, social security number and your postcode and, and whatever. So, yeah, so, so people have a sort of grasp of the technology they're using. Another big story, I think, has been around last summer. Generative image models were a big thing. Feels like a really long time ago. But kind of what goes into the data sets of these models and, and the kind of copyright issues, you know, because these AI models scrape the internet and that includes lots of, well, personal data, but also lots of copyrighted images. And we're now seeing lawsuits from artists and image companies against tech companies for using their copyright content. So I think that's a big thing. Maybe we can skip to asking about Lenser because that's one generative image program. Can you explain it 
to our listeners, I actually had for context a male friend of mine be like, send me 20 pictures of you. And I'm like, why? <laughs> and then he sent me all these pictures of him as an astronaut that this program had, had given him. And I was quite surprised to see what happened to me. And I guess, you know, like I, I sent him quite a few pictures, the pictures of me that I would send to people are like, be looking nice, <laughs> you know, with like some cleavage or like my hair done. But I was quite surprised and shocked about the results so you explain yeah yeah so last year this app called lenzo went completely viral it's an app that lets anyone create ai generated avatars based on actual selfies of yourself and yeah lots of people were having fun playing with it like you could get a really hot photo of yourself as an astronaut or, or whatever but when i uploaded my images into it and as i mentioned earlier i'm, I'm half asian all my images were highly sexualized, like super, like pornified versions of myself. You know, I had full frontals and you know, no nipples, but, you know, massive boobs. I just, you know, I looked like a generic Asian anime character. And I think that was a, like a great example of how bias creeps into these AI systems because they scrape all these images from the web. And, you know, if you think of image models, a lot of free content with a text and image pair is porn. And um, if you look into the data set that went into building the model that fuels Lenza, you search Asian, it's just porn, which is so sad, <laughs> incredibly sad. So yeah, so it's quite disappointing seeing myself or like I wanted a really cool avatar that I can use on my socials. And instead I got these sexy chicks that didn't even look like me. But then funnily enough, when I, that was when I generated images of myself as a woman, but then when I generated images of myself as a man, I got great images. I got images where I actually look like myself. I'm wearing clothes. I mean, I'm still a, you know, a chef or a doctor, which are also kind of Asian stereotypes, but whatever, I'll, I'll let it pass. <laughs> and yeah, I looked confident and assertive and, you know, wasn't modeled on a porn image. When you put your you put your face through the same program and you say yeah. that you're a man, the mm -hmm. images are more to your likeness. Yes, yeah, crazy. Oh my god, I know. I guess I guess it's how the developers have pr programmed it, right? Like in the in the female filter, you have like fairy tale or sexy or whatever, and then the male one, it's just professional, smart or wh whatever. It's crazy. So it feels like a ten years ago problem. Sorry, like, I don't believe you're allowed to bring that to market today. I know, but we haven't learned anything. Like I, I often think about the rise of social social media and like that 10 years ago and trying to find parallels to this day. And I feel like we literally haven't learned anything. All we have is the GDPR and, and that's it. Mm, that's so disappointing because I am really shocked as well because I did use Linda like many other people who are in this space and also got sucked in by the kind of digital <laughs> hype. I'm also half Chinese and I also got so, some pretty terrible results. I got really? nothing that looked like me. I got a lot wow. of anime characters and also, yeah, just a lot of, you know, I feel like I, I felt very catfished because whenever I saw people yes. on TikTok use this, they got these like fairy princesses who actually kind of at least looked like them, whereas I just got these like very generic multiracial looking people yes oh, yeah. also a lot of cleavage so I was just <laughs> like well you know what am I meant to do with this but yeah like you said it's you know I feel like it's so easy for people to say like oh this is like a data state problem or this is like a stereotyping problem but you know I think like Eleanor said taking that step back and saying like why do we not have appropriate procedures for bringing these kinds of products to market and like why are we allowing people who are already I think you know very very vulnerable to forms of being misread but also growing I think with the rise of various kinds of TikTok filters and just more and more forms of kind of digital you know facial transformation I think you're probably getting more and more vulnerable to seeing yourself look very very different online and then having to cope with how that affects your own self-perception and your own relations with other people. 100% and you know these images are you know probably online forever and then they get scraped into other models that are bigger and then that ends up being the the image of humans we see through technology, which is a really, really creepy and sad and disappointing thought. 
Mm-mm. No, it's really fascinating. And like I was talking with someone who's also a journalist, but used to be in the fashion industry and the beauty industry and is now writing a fantastic book called Pixel Flesh, which is all about how digital technologies are affecting ideas of beauty. And she was talking about how filters increasingly replacing, for example, beauty influencers use of makeup or them saying, well, actually, I don't even use makeup anymore. I just use a filter and sort of us becoming like increasingly unable to discern sort of what is the use of beauty products and what's like the use of AI. I also want to ask you about a different AI image generator called Midjourney, because I remember seeing this and thinking it was really fascinating. So hearing that Midjourney had blocked words like placenta, fallopian tubes, mammary glands, sperm, uterine, urethra, cervix, hymen, and vulva, among others, in an attempt to block uh, the creation of pornographic content. And so could you tell us a little bit about this story you reported on and what it showed about the challenges in trying to filter content and trying to create sort of better or more ethical content? Yeah, later I heard that also the word stepmom is banned. <laughs> um, well, that's, that's terrifying. Slash, <laughs> I don't think I want to know why that was banned. but. <laughs> <laughs> it goes to show how hard it is to do content moderation. And well, Mid Journey says it doesn't train in porn, right? But, you know, they have this like, it, it's just impossible to control how people use this. And maybe there's a case for having like two different versions of these models where you can generate biologically accurate images. But, and then, and then in the free one, which is maybe more restricted. But it is kind of sad that you know, the the gender biases go all the way to our internal organs because you just can't stop people from using these technologies to do, to create weird stuff or disturbing stuff. This story was actually brought to my attention by two, one biologist and her friend who were playing around with this technology. You know, I think it was International Women in Science Day. And her friend wanted to create an image of the placenta because her friend studies the placenta and just couldn't do it because it was banned. And then we started digging into it and looking into what other words are banned. And I mean, they are banned because people are weird and they're trying to use these things to create, I guess, pornographic or inappropriate or gory content. And so it's, it's kind of sad that a, a word like, like, it's quite hard for me to imagine placenta porn, but I'm sure that's someone's jam. But it goes to show how hard it is to filter these things, right? Because these models are built on fast data sets that are scraped from the internet. And the more times like something appears in the data set, the stronger the connection comes, becomes in the AI. And it's really sad to see that the data that has gone into these models just like has this extreme bias, like a word like mammary glands, instead of showing you a biological image of mammary glands, you probably get boobs, right? Or... And, but it's also really hard to, to, to stop people from not generating weird content or inappropriate content or unwanted content. So it's a really, really tricky content moderation question. And we don't really understand how image making AR come to the conclusions they do. We don't really understand these systems. So tech companies like the journey, they have, they have good intentions, right? They don't want inappropriate content. So they've just hot fixed it by banning certain words and yeah, it's it's really hard. I don't know what the solution is. Is it trying to come up with ways where you would have image generation systems with like a, a pro section for scientists or researchers or educators, and you might have like more scientific images in that data set so you could actually create fallopian tubes or the placenta and then a free version? Yeah, I don't know. But it, it's one of those fascinating things of bias that just exists and we don't have any fixes to, and is depressing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's why I thought it was such an important, you know, piece of research, because I think there's such an emphasis, or well, certainly Ellen and I see this when we work with industry, in sort of bias fixing. So, okay, how can we strip out forms of discrimination from a system? How can we, you know, immediately make this a more fair and a more equitable data set or a better technology? And that's something that we, you know, work really hard to do is to say, well, you know, yes, it's really important to be trying to address and quantify and mitigate against some of the forms of bias that you're seeing emerge in your technologies. But when you're doing that, you're also treating things like gender or race as, you know, these quantifiable 
easily identifiable characteristics rather than these much wider systems of power. And I know as a journalist, you must have a lot of challenges around how you communicate both the wider ethical issues around these technologies, but also like the quite dense technical inner workings of systems. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about, you know, how do you walk that line and how do you communicate, for example, like technical approaches to addressing bias in AI systems for a lay audience? By keeping the language super, super simple, like there's so much jargon, as you, as you know, you know, instead of using words like hallucinations, you say they just make stuff up and just like really simplify the language and I guess try to keep it high level enough, but still be very precise in the way. And I guess like and understanding it yourself, like if, if, if I fully understand how it works, then it's easy to explain and translate. I try my best. No, absolutely. And I mean, I do think that like this kind of translation work, it must be just a huge amount of labor on your part as well in terms of having to be able to speak to so many different stakeholder groups. And I think it's something MIT Tech Review does really well. I think your work, I think Karen Howe, who we've had on the podcast as well. So for our lovely listeners, please also check out Karen's episode because she's also fantastic. And like Melissa looks a lot at these, you know, what Eleanor's called second order effects or sort of how these technologies are actively being used, how they impact people's lives in very tangible ways. But I mostly just want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was really, really wonderful to get to hear about you and your work. And I've followed and really enjoyed your reporting for a long time. So yeah, it's a really nice to get the chance to chat. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm a big fan of the podcast. So Real privilege to be here. Thank you. This episode was made possible thanks to the generosity of Christina Gore and the McArthur Foundation. It was produced by Eleanor Drage and Kerry McInerney and edited by Eleanor Drage.